Colin, thank you very much indeed for giving up some of your time to talk to ESF Works today. Perhaps you could start by you telling us a little bit about your background and how you came to be looking at energy use in housing and the whole issue of green jobs. Well, I, I come from a construction background. I worked in construction and I've worked on all manner of buildings, but I've worked a lot on housing. And so um, how, how, how buildings work and whether they stay working has always been of interest to me. So, you know, you do work on a building, and you think, oh, I wonder what this would be like in 10 years' time. Or whatever. So the whole idea of energy then and buildings has, uh, uh, kind of brings that loop, closes that loop because in the past we've never had to test buildings. So if you build a house, what people tend to do is look at how it looks as opposed to what it's really doing. And then the energy use of that building is, is, um, is clouded when you move people in it because different people use different amounts of energy. So it's really difficult to tell then whether it worked or it didn't work. All right. So that's really what led me into looking at energy and buildings. Retrofit is the, the idea that you can take existing housing stock and really improve it significantly to improve its uh, energy performance. The project you were looking at was taking that as an idea and trying to consider it in terms of environmental performance as well as its potential for employment creation and for skills and so on. Can you tell us a little bit more about the project and how you came to be doing it? Well, we were invited to join a group, a consortium, a, a partnership, which was led by Groundwork London and who are, I think, principally interested in employment for for youth employment. And so their aim, I think, was to, uh, to work out whether a European-wide retrofitting program would provide work for unemployed and unskilled youth. And so what, what we were asked to do was to look at the methodology for retrofitting. What do you physically need to do? What are the technologies? That kind of thing. And um, so we created a model um, using a, a, a CO2 emissions piece of software, which, which each European country will have under the European uh, under the Energy Performance of Building Directive, which across Europe. So we use the standard package that everybody in this country would recognise, and uh, looked at individual. Um, interventions. So what would happen if we insulate the roof? What will happen if we replace the windows? What will happen if we insulate the walls? And we ended up with some wonderful figures, some wonderful graphs and it, you know, so we, but there was something missing because <laughs> essentially we knew that people who in the know know this already. So what, why were we being asked to do it? And then we looked at the skills needed to do the, those, those jobs and we realised that they were all skilled, it, this was all skilled work. And the renewables bit, which is relatively new, is again skilled work. You're building on existing traditional skills rather than you've got something, you know, something new. So again, this seemed fairly obvious as well. If you put any thought into it, building skills are generally undervalued and people don't realise it is a skilled place to, you know, a skilled form of work. And at that point we went, well, there is something that's missing and that is the people. We have to, there are, there are 20 odd million homes in this country. And the government has got a target of 80% reduction in CO2 by 2050 and aims to achieve a great deal of that in housing, all right, since housing produces some 30% of all CO2 emissions. And, and the same across Europe, same similar targets, all right, and similar emissions. So then you go, right, well, <laughs> if you wanted to do this kind of work on people's homes, there is no way you're going to move you know, 40 million people and we're looking at with, tw with 20 million homes and 40 years between now and 2050 that's a house a minute 
So this is a phenomenal amount of work. And, and it, the, the idea that you're going to move them out of their homes while you do it is, makes it even more difficult. So we think, right, then in that case, the, the key question is, what can you do while people are in their homes? And I think that was a kind of unique perspective that we haven't seen anywhere else. So that's, I think, the core issues. What were the main conclusions that you drew at the end of the project? Well, for me, I started off by thinking, oh yes, we're going to turn every home into a really low energy building, right? And um, kind of the, of the model, if you know anything about this area, the kind of passive house model, um, where you'd have 80, 90% CO2 reductions, very low energy build, uh, very, very low energy bills, uh, very tight uh, air tightness for your building, mechanical ventilation, heat recovery, you know, high-tech stuff. And, um, and then as we interviewed people, we began to see that those jobs that were done that way, and there are some good examples of that in the Retrofit for the Future um, program, were taking, you know, six months to a year to strip out the house and, and you know, Essentially, you take the house back to the bare walls, um, doing things like cutting joists and putting them in joist hangers so you, can, you don't have a thermal bridge in the wall. And, you know, you've got incredible detailing that's going on. And, and to do that, essentially, you need an empty house. So that, that really confirmed what we were talking about earlier on, which was this need to find a way of doing it without moving people out. Now, if you're going to do that, then you need to look at retrofitting from a disturbance point of view. And that, what, in order to do that, what we had to say was, well, we know that the skills are traditional skills, but there are additional skills now if you're going to get people to work in people's homes. And you're looking at things like the hotel industry would have um, how to deal with clients, how to deal with customers, yeah? So this kind of customer relation thing, you know? Um, and it goes from everything from, you know, walk, do you walk in in your muddy boots? Or, you know, do you, do you leave plaster dust all over the place? It goes from that to, to the energy assessment program, how do you knock on a person's house and say, look, we are here to do, are you interested? So there's a whole gamut of, 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 of skills that we have never looked at in terms of craft skills. And there are all of these, if you like, social skills that go with the energy assessor's job. You've identified that what you've called social skills and project management skills is something that's really quite different when it comes to retrofit in comparison to new build. Can you enlarge on that a little bit for us? Well, if you look at um, you look at look at the, the whole range of of what you might call construction training. Now, in that I would include architecture. The, the building professions and the crafts. What we do is we get fixated on our own particular roles. Um, there is usually far more to learn about the specifics of those roles than you've got time to, to, to cover. So, you know, what we don't do is we don't look at the, the social context that, that we're going to work within. Now, what we were saying was that nobody's taught about customer and client, um, what would you call that, uh, social skills. Um, the, the very fact that, that are many of the places which most need this kind of work, people are loath to even open the door. When so they get a knock on the door and um, the fear of opening the door. Um, once you're in the door, you need to be able to express this, this information you're giving them, this potential to reduce their fuel bills, in a way that they can understand. So it's not, it's often it's pointless talking about emissions of carbon dioxide. What people are really interested in is how much pounds per week is it going to save them on their fuel bill. So it's about finding new ways of giving that message, and also give ways that people will trust. Now, 
the whole issue of trust <laughs> is is something that we need to do much more work on. So in with with the current green deal as it stands we need to be to be entirely sure that if we take on a green deal then we will be able to pay for it out of savings and i think at the moment that's not terribly clear we also need to be able to have um, sufficient numbers of builders in place that people will go not do you know a good builder but that they will go do you know a builder and expect a professionalism from those builders in the same way as you would if you say for example you said I need a lawyer or an accountant you expect a level of professionalism and I think that that's currently missing with building perhaps because you're inviting them in your home you don't invite a lawyer into your home um, in, <laughs> unless things are really bad and <laughs> uh, so I th one of the things that, uh, that, that um, becomes clear when you look at this, this problem is that we have to get people in houses that people will trust and, and the message has to be clear. The people giving the message have to be really sure that what they're saying is truthful and that people won't end up with a bill hanging around their neck that they're not going to be able to cope with. That, that energy savings will occur. Now, how are we going to guarantee that when we've already said, as I started off by saying, we never measure anything. So when we, when we, when, when we look at, a, a, look at a, a building, we go, oh, that looks nice. We don't go, I wonder what the energy use is. And then we haven't yet worked out, except within a very small number of people, how you actually test a building. So if, if I were to say, look, you can do a co-heating test, you can be sure that most of the people who hear that expression won't even know what it means, right? Um, that air tightness is not a, a, a thing that people discuss when they look at buildings, but air tightness is as important if you want a low energy building. Um, and, and getting people in the industry as well to know these things is, for example, our, our, our graduates here who go out of here talking about things like low, low uh, thermal bridges and, and uh, air tightness and psi values and y values, all the technical jargon, if you like, that goes with this. You can be sure that a lot of the people they work with won't understand it, won't know. So they go out as, as uh, you know, representatives of this new low energy culture. They need to be sure of what they're talking about and, and, and they need to be trusted. There have been all sorts of projections about the numbers of jobs that, that might be created as a result of a major retrofit initiative. What's your view of the, the real employment potential? I think this is the most difficult aspect of the whole project, really, um, because it depends on a whole range of different things. So, for example, if I said, let's retrofit to 30% reduction in CO2, then and we will guarantee this many houses a year, then I might be able to put a target on it. You know, oh yeah, it'll be 50,000, right? But we, don't, we haven't done that. So, so the number of jobs will depend on the amount of work that is required and the rate at which those jobs come on stream. Now, that alone means that you see um, you see projections that range from 10, 20,000 up to a million. Um, then there is a secondary issue, which is if we have a retrofitting program, we will then need people to produce more insulation, you know, all, all the things we're going to retrofit with. So that will then mean more jobs there, but those people will need factories and transport and all the rest of it. So that's another set of jobs and they will all need lunch and all the rest of it. So do you see how you've got what you might call secondary tertiary jobs associated with it? And that appears to be where most of the difficulty lies in the projections. So um, I read some useful stuff from Canada on that and they, su they suggest that 
it's generally over egged, if you like, and a lot of it is is um, exaggerated for political reasons. Um, so, from from my point of view, I think if we were to decide that these are the levels of of, of CO two reduction, and these are the numbers of buildings we will do each year, then we might get a much better handle on it. Um, and also, so might the supply chain. It's because if we want to retrofit and say replace these windows with new windows, we have to have a supply chain capable of, of giving us that. You talked quite a lot about the skills implications for existing skilled trades, for people in the building trade, for finance, for project management and so on. But what about the issue of, of unemployed people? One of the ideas behind the project was to explore the potential of retrofit for creating new jobs for people to get into the labour market. What sort of things did you find? Well, what we did is we looked at the individual interventions, if you like, what, what you might call an intervention, you know, cavity walls, insulation, or roof insulation, or solar hot water, or photovoltaics. And, and when, when we did a, a fairly subjective, because all of these things are subjective, a skills analysis, we couldn't find anything that you would say that no skills are needed. Now, we thought, initially, we thought, well, what about putting insulation in a roof, all right? And then, I mean, it's, if you've ever been in a roof, you know how easy it is to, <laughs> to step off a joist and walk through the ceiling, all right? So, but, I mean, that sounds qu qu comical. But in Australia, for example, where they put together a, um, a, a insulation program across the country and contractors brought in unskilled people to do that job simply because it was the cheapest labor they could get. And I think the death, uh, death rate was six died, but there were house fires associated with it. There were ele electrocutions. One of the installers died from heat exhaustion from being in the, in the roof space until there was such an outcry over this that the government killed the program. So when you think that something like just putting insulation in a roof can, can, has, such, has such safety implications, so you say, right, well, what else do you actually do when you do a, 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 a low energy retrofit? And as I said, we put all the, all the different jobs down. We thought perhaps changing appliances, all right? So if you take all the white goods in the house and you buy AA rated appliances, you're going to save some energy. Yeah, we say, yeah, that's right. But again, you've got to know, the, you know what, the, what AA means <laughs> to go out and buy it. And, and again, that, that's kind of reflected as well in things like the, the supply chain. So if you ask, a, um, you say, right, I want this, this window because it has really good thermal qualities and, and it's a double glazed window or a triple glazed window and then you give that to your buyer. All right, you're, and they, they go, oh, you know, I found one of those at half the price, here you go. And then you find that that's not got the same qualities. It might be a double or a triple glazed window, but it, you know, it doesn't have the quality that we'd modeled in our prediction. So the, the, nearly everything we looked at, we could not classify it as less than kind of medium skilled. So then you go, right, so what are we really talking about here? So we looked at the skills and we went, there's plumbers, electricians, carpenters, plasterers. Um, we've even got carpet fitters. So, for example, if I want to come in and, say, insulate your wall, I can't do that while your carpets are down. I might have to rip all your skirting boards off. I have to maybe move your electrical sockets. And that's just to insulate a wall. So. Everything needed a set, basic set of craft skills. Now, even the new technologies are built around those basic set of skills. If you take photovoltaics, you need to be an electrician to make the connection. You need a roofer so that when they're stuck on the roof, the roof doesn't leak. Right? You, you might even need a structural engineer to tell you whether the, 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 the rafters can take the weight. But, um, solar thermal, so that's solar hot water. You need a plumber, all right? And again, you need an electrician or a, a plumber with electrical skills, but competence 
And don't forget, it's electricity, so there's a care, duty of, you know, duty holder um, uh, implications here for, for safety. And uh, like I said, we, we kept going through the different jobs that you would do, and we could not see anything that you go, right, this is unskilled. Now, if that is the case, then there is work in this for unskilled people, but they need to be treated to a proper skilling course. All right. And then if the government is serious about pushing the Green Deal so that we do actually deal with 40, 50, you know, t sorry, 20 million houses, then there's going to be plenty of work. So, so there is then the, the impetus to take young, unemployed or out of work or semi-skilled and give them the necessary skills to do this work properly. In theory then, what sort of environmental benefits might conceivably come from retrofitting? Well, I think you've got two ends here we're going to look at this from. If you look at it from the, the kind of, if you like, the micro end, where the people who live in the houses, all right? Uh, if you look at, um, there's a wonderful report from Gentoo Housing Association where they've, they've got a lot of people who are living in fuel poverty. They've done a lot of work on their houses and they haven't necessarily actually saved any energy. But what's happened is people can now afford to live in comfort. All right, so that's an incredibly important issue. And especially as we go deeper into economic meltdown <laughs> or crisis, that uh, people won't be able to afford to, to heat their homes. And then that, of course, has implications for health um, and indeed for the maintenance of the property. Cold, damp houses fall apart quicker than houses that are properly looked after. Uh, so I think there are all sorts of social benefits at the local level. Uh, not, not the least of which is peace of mind that you can actually afford to turn on the heating. Um, from a, a, a macro level, I think that there's obviously the issue of fuel, fuel security. Um, that the North Sea gas, we're now a net, net importer of gas, so we will be taking gas from other countries, so we have no control over the price of our imports. Um, and indeed, we are looking at uh, climate change, so global warming. So if we're going to make policy that's based around um, global warming as being the threat, to humanity, and those words have been used in poli by policymakers. Then, then we really need to approach this in a way that's going to deal with it. So, I think that given that buildings, as I said earlier, thirty percent to forty percent, all buildings forty percent of energy across Europe. So, if we can, if we can cut energy use in buildings by ninety percent, which we can, we know we've got the technology to do it then we will be dealing with that problem as well. So yeah, there are a lot of benefits. One of the issues is about people being able to actually use the, the facilities, the changes that have been made when a house has actually been retrofitted. I think there's some evidence to suggest that you can do all these things, but actually trying to really get the benefits is dependent on how people behave and what they can do. What did the project find out about that? There are two ways of looking at this. There's some wonderful uh, statistics from the Passive House Institute, which show that um, Passive House is based on a, on a, on a target of a maximum energy use of 15 uh, kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. All right, now you go, right, what does that mean? All right, it means that the maximum energy to heat this building can be no more than 15 kilowatt hours, a unit, like an electrical unit. Now, obviously some people use more than that, and obviously some people use less than that. But if you look across a wide enough range of their buildings, what you find is that yeah, they go to about 15 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. So what that tells us is if we get the building right, then on the whole, the buildings will perform. Now, where the problems begin to, to, to develop is, is that we then do fancy things. We go, right, I've got this fabulous boiler with this really brilliant controls. You know, you press this button and this button and this button. The only person that can actually press that button 
are the people who installed it. And often it's not even the people who installed it, it's the people who designed it. So I have seen um, uh, appliances with instructions on control setting with 20 pages. All right. Now, I know that nobody in their right mind is going to read 20 pages of instructions on setting up the heating appliance. In fact, often they won't read any instructions at all, only when they can't get the thing going will they read the instructions. So we have to design controls for, with the people who are going to use them in mind. And uh, so I agree with you that many people move into buildings and they can't make the building work properly because they don't know how the controls work. And a, a, a really good example is a thermostatic radiator valve which is the simplest of, of, of controls, but you find if you ask people, what does this thing do, most people don't actually know. And we haven't learnt by that, and that, that information has been around for years, that if you ask people, they don't know what it does. And yet we still build complicated control systems into things like heating systems. So a lot of people will have a heating system and they override the controls, they just switch it on and off when they need it, because that's the only way they can cope with it. Uh, I think manufacturers, some manufacturers are addressing this. There's a lot of work going on in this area. So yes, I think that's, a, that's a well worth looking at, how we ha ha what the interface between an appliance and the user is. The other th interesting thing about, about uh, occupants is that there's been some very interesting studies on if you train occupants to live a low energy lifestyle then you can actually save as much energy as if you'd done a retrofit on the building. Now yes that, that's quite possible I, 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 I've seen the report so but um, the trouble with training occupants is that we tend to forget and we tend to drift back into our ways of doing things. So I would say it's a combination of the two, that you, or the three things. You, you retrofit the, the, the building, you put in controls that people can understand, that they don't need to be a, like a computer whiz kid to do, and that people learn how to actually live a life that uses less energy. So for example, you open the curtains and switch the lights off, that type of thing. Simple stuff. The report identifies what you call a tipping point, I think, with regards to the real potential for retrofit, that you can invest a certain amount, but there comes a point at which the, you're putting more and more in, but the energy savings are perhaps not so great. Can you expand on that a bit for us? Well, I think first you need to kind of, we need to explain what tipping point is. If you, if you look at a building, you go, right, what can I do? Let's take an, a, a, a poorly performing building, right? Typical of a lot of English stock. What they call hard to heat. And it's got solid walls, it's drafty, it's got single glazed windows and they're drafty and you know, it's got an old boiler if it's got a boiler at all. It might have gas fires or coal fires, yeah? And you say, right, what can we do to this building? Well, there's some really easy things to do. So, if, you know, first we can you know, draft proof the windows and we could insulate the roof. Now, that will save us a huge amount of energy. All right. And then we go, right, well, let's get rid of that old boiler and put in a new condensing boiler. And that will give us at least kind of 80, 90 percent efficiency, say 85 percent efficiency. All right. So you go, oh, great. That's saved another huge amount of, of energy. And Gradually you can see that we picked up the main things that are going to save us energy and we're going to get to a point where as we spend more money we have smaller and smaller and smaller returns. So it's kind of law of diminishing returns. So I could add extra insulation on the, on, in the roof but once I go over 300 mil, right, it's a foot, all right, then, it, then the savings get less and less. It, but the costs, of course, increase and increase. When you price these things, what you find are the easy saves go along nicely and they build up to this gradual increasing costs. And then we get to a point where we're starting to tip quite steeply as we move into things like photovoltaics, for example. Now, photovoltaics are fantastic at reducing the overall CO2 emissions from a building because they offset the electricity that you, that you use. But they're expensive, 
All right. Um, if we go for really airtight building um, with mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, fantastic. All right. But you can imagine how much work you'd have to do to put in a duct work and to seal all the buildings so it makes so it, thermally it makes sense. And so the costs are getting steeper and steeper. Now, what we find and what, what we were told by people we interviewed was that they've looked at these costs and they go, right, well, you get up to, say, 50, 60 percent and you're still on this fairly even um, gradual slope. And then, but if we want to go up to 80, that's where we hit the, the, the curve. And now, for the same price, we could do three houses at, say, 50 percent energy saving as we do one house at 80 percent. So over the set of houses, we've now got 150 percent saving for the same price or we can go for the 80 percent. Now, that's important if you consider that to get up to the 80 percent, we're looking at what we've called deep retrofit. In other words, you're stripping the building back to the bare bones and, and again, that means we have to move people out. So the tipping point not only tells us something about price, but it also tells us something about what's appropriate for that building. So if you were asked to give advice to, to government, to the European Commission, about the real potential for retrofit to, to do these multiple things, to create employment, to save energy, to in, improve the housing stock, what would your message be really as a result of having done the project? I think that um, the first thing they need to do is recognise the scale of the problem. 30% um, of emissions from this country are from homes. So if, if we could do enormous amount of work in reducing energy bills and with this knock-on effect of reducing CO2 emissions. We could do it, but to do it, as, as we've just been talking about, it requires a huge investment. It requires an investment in terms of the, the finance to actually do it, right? It requires an investment in training and skills. And it's not, as we've also said, it's not just kind of traditional building skills, but there are financing skills. Somebody's got to organize the, the money, monetary side of this. There's new skills that we hadn't thought of about before, all right? So this is a huge process and I think that if, if, if we're serious about it then m the only thing I can think of that, that has any kind of um, similar kind of, uh, of situation is kind of wartime production where you go right if this is the issue this is the main issue then we will arrange for industry for training for um, the, the finance we'll, we'll put it all together and then we will attack it. So that, that, I think, if you want to be serious about it, that's what you have to do. If you want to play, then you go, yeah, well, we'll introduce this, that, and the other, and we hope that people will agree to it. Um, we hope that people will allow us into, our, into their homes. Uh, we don't want to disturb them too much, so we will do minimal impact stuff. Well, yeah, that's fine if that's what you're going to do, but it won't deal with the fundamental issue. And, the f and as I said, e EU policy is based on climate change. So we have a 20-20-20 plan, it was 20% reduction, 20% renewables by 2020. Now, why are we doing it? We have the Energy Performance in Building Directive. That's, that's going to measure energy in all the buildings in Europe. So again, why are we doing it? If we are going to spend money on doing this, we need to do it properly. And for that, you need properly skilled people, you need uh, properly financed uh, proposals, and you need people to trust that when you say, we will do this and it will reduce your energy bills by such and such, yeah, that it does. It does. And for that, then, as a, as a university, for example, that's where our focus could be in, in terms of research. We follow these projects and we observe them and we get feedback from them. We look at whether it's actually doing it. We look at the skills associated with it. We look at 
snag-free building. So when we leave, your house is as good as it could be under the circumstances, uh, given that we've, you know, we've, we've insulated the walls, let's say, right? That we have, your carpet is back and flat, all right? So that we, when we finish, we leave you, you tell your neighbor that it was great. Now, they, yeah, they were, you know, disturbance for a couple of weeks, but look what we've got now, right? That's what it needs, and there's a ton of research in how that would work. Right? And not the least of which are those social skills that we spoke about earlier on. There are also things that, that, that you, could, you could bring in people who aren't builders. So th things like we spoke to people in Queen's Park who, who, who have a lot of young kids looking for work. And you know, they could be doing things like moving furniture. They could be, you know, provided that you're going to organize this properly, you could bring in all sorts of, of semi-skilled or unskilled people. But it, it needs to be properly organized. And as I said, the only thing I can think of are on that scale is, say, wartime footing. So we could go. We're going to go for a 30% energy reduction across 500,000 homes in the next two years. Right. Find the money for it. Train the people to do it. Let's get on with it. Colin, thank you very much indeed for your time. Well, thank you. Uh, it's very difficult to kind of sum up what is a huge area of work and, and indeed what we're just trying to find out about. So we're hoping that we will develop research in this area and when we do, we will be in contact with you and let you know what we found out.